Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Gracious Father, once again we come to you in prayer in this time, Lord. I just want to ask you, Father, that all the distractions that clutter our minds may be removed. And for the next several minutes, Lord, just help us focus on the message you have for us. Be with each one of us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Good and bad news. I have good news to share with you, and I have bad news to share with you. <laughs> the bad news is that today we come to the end of our series, the book of the Bible. So today we're going to have the last sermon that's going to address the Bible itself. The good news is that I hope today we can actually learn a little better how to study and understand the Bible. So today is going to be a very practical sermon, and I'm going to ask Bob uh, if he can give out, um, it's pretty much the outline for the sermon. Um, and I, I want you to have it. Um, we're going to do a sample. You can write on that outline. Uh, because I want it to be practical and not just theoretical. So, Bob, do you have those papers? Can we give them out, please? Um, it was actually this morning I woke up and I was uh, going through the sermon with my, in my mind and, and suddenly it just hit me. Why not make it really practical? So I went to my office and I started writing down some, kind of the major, no, major topics and major points and that's why you're going to be able to take it home, and then we're going to actually practice and do a little something. So, anyways, let's review a little bit of what we studied in the previous weeks. Can we trust the Bible? That is a big question. Can we trust the Bible? And the answer yes is yes, we can trust the Bible. Nowadays, we can. Archaeology has proven that the Bible is accurate. Archaeology has not uncovered everything that is mentioned in the Bible, but everything that archaeologists were able to find does not contradict the Bible. Science has confirmed what is written in the scriptures, and if you remember, I gave you several Bible verses that where the Bible says um, something pertaining to science, and back several hundred years before our time, science believed in something different, but nowadays our science is confirming what the Bible says. Uh, one of the examples, for instance, is that the Bible says that there is life in the blood. <clears throat> Remember that? And then, uh, for many years, doctors believed that when a person was sick, there was something wrong with their blood, and so they had to bleed that person. Science today affirms the opposite to that. So science confirms some of the biblical teachings. The prophets also confirms that. You know, many prophecies there were said and they were written in the scriptures that came to pass. Non-Christian historians also confirm scriptural or biblical events. So we can look at the scriptures and say, yes, this is an inspired book, just like Bob mentioned. This is an inspired book where God is revealing himself to mankind. Now, what is the purpose of the Bible? <clears throat> All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. And I gave you the example of a line on the, on the floor Scripture tells us we need to follow that line. But if somewhere down the road we kind of detour from the line, then the Scripture wakes us up and tells us go back to the line and then teaches us again how to stay in that line. So how the Bible changes us? That was the, another topic that we talked about. He strengthens our faith. He gives us hope. He eradicates our guilt. And ultimately, He sets us free. He sets us free from the trap and from the seeds from Satan. And then what happens when God opens our eyes? We see solution to our problems. Remember we talked about um, Hagar 
and Ishmael, they were in the desert, and God, instead of giving her or, or pointing out to her solution to her problem, just tell, just told her to believe and to to have faith that something was coming up, and uh, and she lifted up her eyes and she saw then the solution to her problem. We also see a barrier to our progress, and we talked about Balaam and how the donkey was actually protecting Balaam. We see the protection from whom or what is attacking me. And we talked about Elisha when he's surrounded by uh, an entire army and how he opened or how he prayed and God opened his servant's eyes and they saw surrounding the surrounding army, uh, the army, an army of angels. And then finally we see how God is walking with me. And we talked about the disciples from Hemaeus as they're walking and Jesus is walking right beside them. So, um, okay, this froze. Laura, can you click over there? It seems to not moving forward. It kind of froze. Okay, um, maybe the batteries here are dead. I don't know. There you go. Okay, you may have to stay there. I'm sorry. So today, I want to go more in detail how to study a Bible passage, how to understand. And understand that there's many ways to study the scriptures depending on the purpose of it. We're just going to stay on a very simple study, which would be the most uh, used for many of us, which is just the devotional study. And I'm going to give you four different ways or four different steps as we go through this study. Can you click again, Laura, please? Okay. There's four different steps. Step number one, just go ahead. It's the observation. We're going to do a summary and then we'll practice. The observation. And the observation is a step where you are asking questions. You read a text and then you ask questions. Go ahead and click again. What does it say? Keep clicking. Who is involved? What is the background? Where does it take place? When does it take place? And there are a whole pile of other questions that you can ask. The purpose when you read the text is for you to write down your observations. What are you observing from the text? When does this take place? What happens in the text? What's the background? Who's involved in the text? It's the what, uh, why, where, when, how, and uh, who questions that you ask about the text. Then the next, please. After the observation, then we have to come to an interpretation. Now, the interpretation many times depends upon our emotions, upon our knowledge, upon our state of mind. But ultimately, the text should speak itself. So the interpretation, go ahead and click another one. Now this time the interpretation focus more on the what or why question. What does it mean? What is the message? And um, what can I learn from it? So it goes on the what and why question. After the interpretation, go ahead to the next one, please. We have the correlation. Now, here it's a here we, we can pause and skip to the last step, or we can go through this step, the correlation. The correlation basically is if you want to do a more in-depth study, then you look in other parts of the scriptures where they may have information that correlates to what you are studying. For instance, let's say we're doing a study on prophecies and we go to the book of Revelations and we're reading something pertaining to prophecies. And we do not understand what we're reading. Some of the words are strange to us. We, we, we struggle to understand. But since the scripture is supposed to explain itself, we can go to other sections of the scripture and understand what certain words mean. So in the Revelation, if he talks about the sea, for instance, we can go to other passages in the scriptures and understand the meaning of the word sea. Or if he talks about multitudes or if he talks about anything else, we try to find 
the explanation and the meaning to those passages or those words somewhere else in the scriptures. Obviously, many of our Bibles today have the cross-reference, which already gives us a, a, a help in finding the explanation to those verses. But it's important, especially when you go through the interpretation, that you don't use those cross-reference or even that you don't read the author or the editor's comments on the scriptures. Because when you go through observation, interpretation, you really want to interpret what the text is telling you. You want to be very uh, specific to what the text is telling you. So you can go then through the correlation, what other verses explain, or you can skip to the last step, which is number four, the application. And on the application, basically just ask the question, what am I going to do about it? You had a study. In this study, you learned something. Now what? What are you going to do with that information? And so you just ask that question. What am I going to do about it? Now, maybe the most important point when you're reading the scriptures is the application. Having all the knowledge before, but not having the application is just that. It's just knowledge. So you're missing the point. So those are the four different steps that when we're studying the scriptures for devotional sake, we can embrace and we can follow and we can use to help us um, do a deeper study. So I would like to ask you now to open your Bibles. We're going to read those three verses, those three uh, passages. Matthew 9, 1 to 8. And I'm going to ask one of you to read. Um, maybe one of the deacons can just go around with a microphone so we can all hear. Uh, Matthew 9, 1 to 8. Then I'm going to ask somebody else to read Mark 2, 1 to 12. And then Luke 5, 17 to 26. All right. Do we have a deacon with a microphone that uh, can take it to whoever's going to read? Thanks, Andrew. Appreciate it. Oh, there's a microphone here. Okay. All right. Who can read Matthew 9, 1 to 8? Matthew 9, 1 to 8. All right. Now listen carefully to his reading. Matthew 9, 1 to 8. And he entered in a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick, lying on a bed, and Jesus, seeking their faith, and unto sick of the palsy. <clears throat> Son, be good cheer, the sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of scribes said with them themselves, this man blasphemy. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore, think evil in your heart, for wherever it's easy to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive, then earth be to sick of the palsy. Arise, take up thy bed, and go to the house, to your house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when, the, when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. All right, thank you. Now, what is this text talking about? Just, just in one sentence. Jesus doing what? What? I couldn't hear. Healing the sick, healing the paralytic, okay? Now, this passage is also written in other Gospels. And so let's jump to uh, Mark, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Let's look at the book of Mark, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Who could read that? Mark, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Mark 2, 1 to 12. All right, thank you. 
When he entered again into Capernaum after some days, it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many were gathered together, so that there was no more room, not even around the door, and he spoke the word to them. Four people came, carrying a paralytic to him. When they could not come near to him for the crowd, they removed the roof where he was. When they had broken it up, they let down the mat that the paralytic was lying on. Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. But there were some of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like that? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, said to them, Why do you reason these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to tell the paralytic your sins are forgiven, or to say, Arise and take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, arise, take up your mat and go to your house. He arose and immediately took up the mat and went out in front of them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. All right, thank you. Same event, written by a different author. Same event, written by a different author. Now, Luke chapter 5. Who can read Luke chapter 5? All right, Luke chapter 5, from 17 to 22. To 26, I'm sorry. Yep. And it came about one day that he was teaching, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. And behold, some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of him. And not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and led him down through the tiles with his stretcher right in the center in front of Jesus. And seeing their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus, aware of their reasonings, answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins have been forgiven you, or to say, Rise and walk? But in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise and take your stretcher and go home. And at once he rose up before them and took up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. One more. And they were all seized with astonishment and began glorifying God, and they were filled with fear, saying, We have seen remarkable things today. All right, thank you. Three different Gospels presenting the same event. Why are three different Gospels? And why are they not they all written the same way? Well, that's a good question. So I'm going to ask, Rick, could you come here for a second, please? Would you mind coming here for a second? Rick? Yeah? Okay, Bob, where are you? Bob, come here. All right, Andrew, you're already standing over there. Come up here. Andrew, come here. Okay? All right, stay here on this side. Bob, stay there by the stairs. Andrew, stay on this side. Okay? Bob, go over there. Here. All right. Okay, I need, I need to explain this before okay. I can do it. Okay, I want, Rick, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you to describe what you see here. Okay, Bob, I want you sideways, and I'm going to ask you to describe what you see. All right? Andrew, you, you're on this side, and I'm going to ask you to describe what you see there, okay? All right, so describe that. See an Ecker <coughs> computer screen above a EV uh, speaker, and both ones, well, they, the unit on the top is about 18 inches by 12 inches. The unit on the bottom is for sound, and it's uh, angled. Black, both are black. This has a sil silver border. And uh, yeah, one has a 
funnel on the side. The, the one on the bottom has a funnel type arrangement on, this, on the left hand side. All right, thank you. Bob, can you describe what you see? I see what Rick saw from 90 degrees. <laughs> uh, actually, I see, a, I see a box and it's sort of angled on the top and there's a hole in the side here to reach to and get inside and do stuff. And it's sort of notched out so it fits on the step, otherwise it would tip over. Oh, so you see more than what Rick does. Yeah. Oh, okay. Interesting. Andrew, what do you see from that side? It seems there is a screen here uh, on the top of the box and also it has a support behind it. The screen is uh, in, in an angle and the uh, support has four screws and the box and the supports are black. Okay, all right. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate that. appreciate your help. You see, what we're doing is that the different Gospels present the same event but seen from different perspectives. It's the same story. So. From Matthew, we, had, we, we were able to get a little bit of information, just like Rick was here, quite descriptive. Uh, I mean, he even went to the detail of the inches, how, how big this screen is. I was impressed with that. Um, now, Mark adds a few other ex details, just like Bob did with the, the round circle here and the, and the hole in between. Even though Bob started by saying, I see everything that he does, yes, but there's a little extra to it. And then Luke comes and adds more details or removes some information. And so he's on the other side looking at the same event, but now describing that event from uh, his own perspective. So when we're studying a scripture, it's good sometimes, especially if you're in the book of, if, you, if we're looking in the gospel, see if that same passage is presented or it's written on the other gospels. Because that will help us get a clear or a better idea of the big picture. So this is what, this is what we did. Go ahead, uh, Laura. I took the liberty to compile all the three gospels, uh, all the three passages of these gospels uh, into just a one text. And uh, I hope you can understand the difference in the colors because they match uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Mark is a little bit more greenish and Luke uh, is kind of on, it's, it's white. So now let's read what you read, but kind of seeing all together. So he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. Now Mark says, and again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. And Luke adds, now it happened on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law by, who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. Put all together, the only, the only uh, parts that I did not add here is that if they repeat itself with the exact same words. Okay? So immediately many gathered together, so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Now, are you, are you understanding what we're doing? And are you seeing the different details now being added to the text? Then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Then behold, man brought a bed on a bed man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. Then they came to him, bring a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up the house top and led him down with his bed through the tiling in the midst before Jesus. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed, uh, the bed on which the paralytic was lying. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven. I'm using the New King James Version, just in case uh, you're trying to follow along. And at once some of the scribes said, This man blasphemes. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? 
And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? But immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? But when Jesus perceived their thought, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, take up your bed and walk? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who, has, who was paralyzed, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And he arose and departed to his house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out into the presence of them all. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. Now when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, who had given such power to man. So that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. So, before we get there, do you see now a complete picture of the same event, but now written by three different Gospels, pulled together into just a one text? Now, as you're doing this, and obviously devotion takes time, and as you're doing the devotion, you need to sit down, and you need to be able to write. Otherwise, you're just missing the point. So you put together the text, if you have the possibility to do that, you may want to remove the parts that repeat itself, and now you're getting a clear picture of what happens. All right, so observation. Observation comes from carefully reading scripture, uh, looking in detail at every sentence and word, and then writing it down, everything you see. Remember, writing it down, everything you see. Make it a habit of writing it down. You are trying to answer the question, what does it say? What is in the text? No bias, no prejudice, no, no preconceived ideas. You're just trying to observe the text. So the basic questions to ask then are, what, why, when, how, where, and who? And ask questions. As many questions as you can ask, just go through those questions. Go ahead, next slide, please. The key things that you, are look, that you can look for in the text, keywords, repeated words or phrases, questions being asked, answers being given, commands, warnings, comparisons, contrasts, illustrations, causes and effects and reasons for doing things, promises, and their conditions for fulfilling, list of things, results. You see a whole pile of information that you can gather from what you're reading just by asking questions. When you have three verses, and on those three verses, you have the same idea coming up over and over and over again, maybe that idea, it's important, and maybe we need to pay a little more attention to that. Now you're looking at repeated words or phrases. But you need to take time, and you need to ask the question in order to do that. So, let's go ahead to the next one. Now that's where it gets practical. You have your papers there in front of you. So, go ahead, one more. Let's answer the first question. And I could have... Uh, oh, okay, so we, today we're just going to answer these four questions on the observation. There are a lot more questions that you could have answered, but we're just going to answer these four questions. So let's make it practical. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so just hold on, uh, Laura. Let's answer the first question. Where does it take place? You've read the text. We put the text together. 
Now, where does this take place? Where? Where does this take place? Capernaum. What else? Are there any other informations from the text that helps us specify where does it take place? In a house? Anywhere else? Anything else that helps us answer this question? Obviously, we can't really remember all the details. That's why it's important to write it down. Okay? So let's see the answer. Okay, where does it take place? Capernaum. His own city, there's a detail there that refers to Capernaum as being his own city, and then in a house. Okay, we're answering. Now, somehow we know that this is in Galilee. Jesus was not born in Capernaum, and yet the text refers to it as being his own city. Why is that? Now your mind is starting to go other places, wondering why is that. And we know also from the text that he is in a house. Okay. Now we're starting to answer those questions. And then the next question, when does it take place? When does it take place? The what? Okay, after some days, okay, that's what the scripture says. Hold on to that thought, John. We'll come back to that. What else? What does the text say? When does it take place? Any thoughts? There's a couple more details there. Okay, I'll give you the answer then. All right, when does it take place? Let's go to the answer. All right, Laura. After crossing to the other side of the lake, it's one of the information, after some days and while he was teaching. This is the information from the text that pertains to the when. Now, okay, we know that it can it happen after some days. But what does that mean, after some days? John, after some days regarding to what? The context of what happened before. Very good. Which would be, in this case, healing lepers or other versions, depending on how they structure the, the, their information, could be before his trip across the lake, which was when he was in the, um, when he healed the, the gathering, when he cast out the demons from him. Remember, it says that after he crossed to the other side. So this happened on the other side of the lake, and it was after he crossed. So we have some information now that helps us kind of determine the time frame. After crossing to the other side of the lake, after some days from the previous experience that was worthwhile mentioning for the disciples, and now this particular event happens while he was teaching. Yes? How do you get to that information? Okay, so now your mind is taking you further. Yeah, your mind is so, so there's no limit. We can now start embracing the text. Thank you, appreciate that. All right, so when does it take place? After crossing to the other side, after some days, while he was teaching. All right, let's continue. What happens? Now, this part is, is us trying to tell the story using our own words. So what happens in this story? Anyone wants to try? In a very short summary, what happens here? Okay, and then what happens? Okay, and then what happens? And then what happens? You're telling the story. Okay, and ultimately... Okay, so we have a short summary of all the three Gospels bringing together on this event. So let's, let's see what, what happens. So Jesus is eating to a diverse multitude. His fr friends bring to him a paralytic, but have to lower him through the roof because there is no room. Jesus forgives the paralytic and heals him. And Jesus ultimately assumes his divinity. Now, this is just me summarizing the text. And I'm summarizing based you know, on the information we have, and it's my way of writing it. Obviously, you would write in a way that you understand. So this, there's no right way 
or no mean, no saying that you have to do the way I wrote this down. It's just the way you summarize the story. But as you summarize the story and as you put it with the, your own words, you get a clear or a better idea of what the story tells us. And now, last question. Who is involved in this story? Remember? Who is involved in the story? The what? I can't hear. <laughs> okay, we have Pharisees. Okay, who else? The what? Jesus is there. Who else? The paralytic. Who else? Four men, his friends. Okay, who else? Teachers of the law. Okay. Thank you. Yep, go ahead. John? The what? The multitudes. Uh, did I see a hand there? The power of God. Okay. You see how we're starting to put together a list of things, a list of uh, answers? Okay, so who is involved? I wrote Jesus, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, which are called the scribes, the multitude, paralytic, and four men. Okay? The text, interesting though, the text does not mention the disciples. You notice that? Now, can we assume that the disciples were there? Is it safe to assume that? Yes, it's safe, but the text doesn't mention the disciples. So I did not put their names here, or, their, or I made reference to them. So this, we're just in the realm of the observation, and we're just building our concept of the story, okay? So the observation, let's go to now to the interpretation. Okay, interpretation, next. Interpretation helps you discover the biblical writer's purpose and passage. Interpretate, interpretative questions include asking what or why. So let's see those questions. Why was the paralytic lowered through the roof? Couldn't get one? I, I, I'm sorry. That was the only way he couldn't get in. Okay, because the crowd kept him from coming to Jesus through the door. Do we agree with this uh, answer? I mean, it's pretty much what you're saying, right? Okay, next question. Why is the, is, why is the, the significance, oh, I'm sorry, what is the significance of lowering the paralytic through the roof? Now, what is the significance of it? The one? John? To show their faith. Okay, what else? Any other thoughts? What is the significance of that, of lowering him through the roof? Sorry, I'm sorry, hang on. That there is no barrier when one get, wants to get to Jesus. Okay, any other thoughts? Dedication of their friends, and I saw him. They wrecked the roof, yeah. I don't know if the homeowner was happy with that. Okay, this is what I wrote. His friends were committed in bringing the paralytic to Jesus. Sometimes we can be barriers that keep others from coming to Christ. It's me writing this. It doesn't have to be your interpretation, but I was doing this as an exercise, okay? Yes, what is the significance is that sometimes I can be a barrier from others to come to Christ. Let's continue, a couple more questions. Why did Jesus first forgive the paralytic sins? Remember on the story, the paralytic is lower down, and Jesus forgives him his sins. It's almost like he stops right there. Why did Jesus do this first? John. Whose faith? Okay. What other explanations? To show his divinity. Okay. What else? The paralytic was ready to be cleansed of sins. Okay. You see how the interpretations are coming up? This is what I wrote. So he, Jesus, could affirm his divinity. It's almost like he had a little plan to affirm his divinity. Let's go to the next question. So what is the significance of this demonstration of affirming his uh, divinity? Any ideas? Oh, time is going so fast. Let's go to the answer, please. Okay, this is what I wrote. What is the significance to the, of this demonstration? The multitudes marveled and glorified God. Why, when they saw Jesus healing the paralytic, and when they saw him, Jesus, uh, Jesus telling him, rise up and walk, the multitudes marvel and glorify God. Another question. Why is this important to us? 
or to them at that time. Because Jesus wanted the people to know that he is the Son of Man and that he has power to heal and to forgive. Now, this is just me kind of going over the text and, and, and just writing some things down. All right? That's part of the interpretation. Now, if we wanted to do the correlation, then let's talk a little bit about this. This step involves finding cross-references in order to further explain the meaning of the text. The Bible interprets itself. All right? So how do we do this? For instance, we could say, let's look at what the Bible has to say about Jesus' divinity. Let's look at what the Bible says about friendship or about forgiveness and healing. Or even, let's see what, what does the Bible say about Pharisees. You know, and so now we're starting to look at other areas in scriptures if we want to expand our research, if we want to expand our study. What can we use on the correlation stage? We could use different Bible versions. And uh, if you don't have them at home, there's a good website where you can find those Bible versions. Uh, Bible Gateway. We can use Bible commentaries. Uh, Ellen White also helps explain Bible dictionaries, concordances. There's a lot of resources, and we have a library here that you can actually come and use. So uh, many of these resources, uh, they're, they're available. This is if you want to do an extended study, if you want to use the correlation. Now let's go ahead to, uh, to the application. The purpose of Bible study is to be transformed by God's Word. Bible study has to be um, transformational. Do we say it like that? Is this proper English? Has to be transformational? A Bible study that is not transformational it just ends up being knowledge. And James talks about that. I wrote that text. I think it's James 1.22. It, it gives way to pride. So if Bible study is not transformational, it just becomes knowledge. And that gives way to pride. So, in which group am I? The Pharisees, the crowd, or the friends? I'm placing now myself in face of the text. Am I one of the Pharisees that in light of the miracle, and I start wondering, who gave you power to do that? Who do you think you are not to do something like that? To forgive sins? Who, who are you? Am I the Pharisee now questioning that? Or am I part of the crowd that, you know, I want so much being the church that, you know, it doesn't matter anything else. I'm the one that only matters. Or am I part of the friends? I am committed no matter what, even if I have to go through the roof and lower the, the paralytic through the, roof, through the roof. I am committed to bring people to Jesus. So in which group am I? And now I'm thinking. And I'm processing. Or how committed am I in bringing people to Christ? Or how will... Will, uh, will I change my Bible study methodology, my Bible study habits? Will this Bible study change who I am? You start asking questions, but in a way that you can apply it. You can make it practical. It has to be transformational. If it's not, then we're missing the point. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> when we're studying the scriptures, we're unveiling, we're discovering, we're going on a journey. And, and when we're studying with the purpose of growing spiritually, we can follow these different steps. Observation, interpretation, correlation, and application. The most important is the application. I will, I, I'm going to encourage you, I'm going to stop here for sake of time, but I'm going to encourage you as you go home, do this study again. You have the, the paper in front of you. Do this study again. Answer questions. Add a lot more questions than the ones that you have on that paper. You can ask a lot more questions. Write down the answers. Write down your observations. What is it that you see? Write all that down. Ask the questions. Put it in a paper. And ultimately, spend time in the application. And sometimes we struggle with the application because we see the text telling us something and our lives are struggling with that. It seems that our lives are not in line with that. That moment, just pray. Lord, I'm struggling with this. Help me. I need your help. I need to apply this to my life, but I don't know how. Help me. I see that the text is talking about pride. Oh, Father, it's been one of my sins. I'm too proud. Please help me be more humble. 
and pray about that. But make sure it's always applicable to our lives.